Thank you. Welcome to the September 12, 2019 work session for the Henrico County Public School Board. <laughs> Members of the board, you've seen the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. Is all those in favor of the cape for saying aye? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. The motion carries. First item on the agenda is to um, is to go to closed session uh, for discussion of matters covered under items A1 and A2 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia 1950 is amended pertaining to the following, the assignment appointment, performance disciplining and release of contract for specific school board employees and request for religious exemption from compulsory education. Members of the board, is there a motion to go into closed session for those purposes? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Ogburn, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Pike. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, the ayes have it. We'll be back shortly. All right, members of the board, the next item on the agenda is to certify that only those items and only those matters that were identified in the motion uh, convening closed session were discussed in closed session. Is there a motion for such certification? So, so moved. Moved by Mrs. Cox, <laughs> seconded by Reverend Cooper. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The closed session is uh, certified. Dr. Cashway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The first item I have is a request for your approval for release from compulsory attendance for student cases numbers 19-20-RE-1 as well as 19-20-RE-2 and 19-20-RE-3 based on bona fide religious beliefs. And as always, the names of students are protected under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Thank you, members of the board. You've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding uh, the exemption for compulsory attendance for <laughs> religious reasons for case numbers 19-20-RE-1, RE-2, and RE-3. Is there a motion to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Pike. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. The exemptions are granted. Thank you. The next item is a request for your approval for the appointment of administrative personnel for the 1920 school year. Members of the board, we've seen the superintendent's recommendation regarding these administrative appointments. Is there a motion to adopt her recommendation as presented? So moved. Moved by uh, Mrs. Cock. Is there a second? Second. Second by Reverend Cooper. All those in favor <laughs> indicate the saying aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries. Would you share those with us, Thank please? you. The board has just approved the following appointments. Tracy Spain, Principal, Springfield Park Elementary School. Dana Haas, Assistant Principal, Fairfield Middle School. David Leith, Assistant Principal, Elko Middle School. And Elizabeth Terrier, Assistant Principal, Highland Springs High School. And we'll have an opportunity to meet those administrators um, at our monthly meeting. Wonderful. And I, I believe with those, we're down to just... Uh, one one uh, administrative appointment. So at this point in the beginning of the school year, that is uh, good news, I know, for uh, parents, students, and especially their co-administrators and faculty. So thank you for the hard work in getting that done. All right. Thank next you. Item, All right, for the next item, um, Dr. Hinton is going to provide the board with a, some strategic plan proposed updates. And so we'll welcome her. And now. board members, we have everybody draw your attention to the notebook at our place here, I believe. That's right. That we have ready to go. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell, today we will be pro providing an update on the proposed updates to the 2018-25 strategic plan, as well as updates on our progress. Henrico County Public Schools has two guiding documents that outline long-range plans for the school division. The first is the 2018-25 strategic plan, which was approved in June of 2018 and was developed through a year-long process involving community stakeholders. The group was guided by a 22-member steering committee and informed by work groups comprised of students, families, staff, and community members. The strategic plan outlines next steps for the school division related to eight goals, including full accreditation for all schools, transformation of the curriculum, 
creating an inclusive, safe, and supportive climate, recruitment and retention of educators, cultivation of collaborative partnerships, celebrating our strength of diversity, providing equitable and secure physical learning environments, and providing learner-centered experiences. In July of 2018, Henrico welcomed Dr. Cashwell as our superintendent. She spent her first 100 days visiting with schools, families, local leaders, community groups, and interested citizens. Through her travels, she identified areas of strength and opportunity related to each Henrico cornerstone of safety and wellness, academic growth, equity and opportunity, and relationships, which are outlined within her passport. Work was underway this past school year to accomplish multiple action steps that were inclusive of both the strategic plan and Amy's passport. We continue to prioritize the division's literacy plan as a driver of instructional practices. A work group was formed to focus on literacy instruction in kindergarten through grade five, and the division added Chromebooks to grades two through five to help support personalized learning and reading. The division was also able to add five additional reading specialist positions for the 2019-20 school year, and we're beginning to explore how best to use current resources to staff additional positions in the future. We've provided additional reading materials to school, and a plan is being established for funding classroom libraries and additional guiding, re guided reading materials. The 2019-20 budget adds additional funds for textbooks to support the purchase of classroom materials to support small group literacy instruction. We've also been working to integrate STEAM instruction into our elementary classrooms. Additional innovative learning coaches have been hired to facilitate the inclusion of STEAM concepts across the curriculum. Throughout the 1819 school year, work has also been done to audit the curriculum and develop a plan to ensure the Henrico learner profile components are embedded throughout. This includes the four pillars of deeper learning as well as the six C's. A plan for professional development is being developed as well as a formal observation tool aligned with Henrico learner profile. In spring of 2019, Henrico also administered an annual climate survey to collect baseline data on areas of strength and improvement related to the four cornerstones. In order to ensure we're providing an inclusive, safe, and supportive climate, beginning in the 1920 school year, an online training course was implemented for all staff on cultural sensitivity. We're also continuing to develop a plan to actively recruit and retain a diverse workforce. This work was begun by the Equity and Diversity Advisory Co Committee, who researched best practices to provide human resources as they redesign recruitment efforts. To support with retention, we are also developing career ladders for teachers to provide additional pathways for increased compensation. We've also established a joint government and schools committee, which was approved through a resolution in January to annually examine employee compensation matters. So as you can see, we've made significant progress towards our goals, but we still do have work to do. To help streamline our planning documents, in August, we reconvened our Strategic Planning Steering Committee. We had about half of the original members, and we welcomed new members who had supported the work previously in another capacity, or who brought a unique perspective to the work. The committee included a student, teachers, administrators, parents, and business partners, as well as two school, school board members. And I'd like to thank Ms. Cock and um, Mr. Pike for their work on this committee. The committee was charged to combine the level action plans for the three strategic goals related to transformation of the curriculum, cultivating collaborative partnerships, and creating learner-centered experiences. So currently within the plan, you can see that for those three goals, we have an elementary, a middle, and a high school work plan. But what we were finding as we went to try to implement that is that we weren't seeing the continu continuity of the learning experiences across the grade levels. So the committee worked to combine those plans. They also worked to align the strategic plan with Amy's passport recommendations and next steps. They identified some overarching metrics that we can use for public reporting of our progress. 
as well as provided recommendations for communicating our work towards meeting our goals, which is a step in Amy's passport as well. The committee spent the morning working to align our planning documents, and the proposed updates are provided as an attachment for your review, and they're in board docs. The updates are not meant to completely overhaul the plan, but instead to provide consistency of direction and next steps. So for example, under the goal related to accreditation of English learners, we've added an implementation driver regarding the creation of the educational specialist position for English as a second language. And so that's an item that was in Amy's passport that we now propose to include in our strategic plan. The primary purpose for these proposed updates is to clearly demonstrate the alignment between the strategic plan and Amy's passport to our community. As I mentioned earlier, the committee was also charged to identify overarching measures of progress related to the goals that can be community indicators of improvement. Seven key performance metrics are being proposed, including school state accreditation, student attendance and chronic absenteeism, staff and student demographic comparisons, teacher retention data, data from our stakeholder surveys, school safety audits and maintenance audit reports, and community partnership activities. Data on these metrics would be updated annually to communicate progress to our community. So today we're here sharing the proposed updates to the plan, and we would like to hold a public hearing on September the 26th from 5.30 at the Newbridge Auditorium. And then following that, we would request school board approval of the updated plan in October 24th. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Members of the board, do you have any questions of the material presented or the material that was in our in board docs? Yes, Reverend Cooper. So thank you, Dr. Hayden, for your work and for the committee's work. Quick question. Under the proposed key metric, key performance metric, the um, staff and student demographic comparison, that third bullet point. So what is there a defined number that we're going to shoot for as far as uh, the demographic alignment? with students and staff, is there a number that we're looking for as far as that, that metric? Um, well, one of the drivers in the, in the plan is to create a more diverse workforce. So creating a workforce that mirrors our student population as closely as we can, can get it there. So the metric will really be looking at um, the student um, demographics and related to the staff demographics to make sure that we're doing our best to hire staff that represent our student populations. There's not a specific value that we're looking for, but we are looking to make progress in that area. So if, we, if we're looking to make progress, we kind of have to have a baseline mm -hmm. that we're, do we have the baseline yet? Well, we do have our student information and we can get that for you as well just, as the staff. I would love to see it, you know, because I was in a meeting with the mm -hmm. equity and diversity subcommittee and we were talking about HR practices and I saw some figures um, with our Director of Human Resources present as well. Um, and so we do know that we have a lot of work to do in regards to mirroring our staff with our student body. It would just be interesting because I think it's, it goes in, in conjunction with uh, recruitment, retention, and rewarding um, of our staff members. And so I would just love if you could to kind of provide that for me. Sure. It would be very helpful. Thank yes. you. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I would just like to say that, um, that I know that Mr. Pike and I enjoyed working with the committee. Um, this was really roll up your sleeves kind of work and, and it was a very busy time. Um, but the way that we do our strategic plan, it is so collaborative with our parents and community, our staff as well, all working together um, at one table on specific issues and then just sharing it all out. It's a beautiful process. And I wish everyone could see that transparency piece and of how it evolves and that it's not, you know, already, you don't already have it and hand it to us and go, okay, edit it. Mm -hmm. it, it really bubbles up from the work of the committee. And just um, thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed being on that committee, but this time particularly aligning it with Amy's passport it just gives the, the, um, the school system a more clear direction of where we're going. Thank, thank you. you. Very good. Mr. Yes. I do have one quick yes. question. Um, after approval and it, um, any updates and all that, how are we going to share this with the community? I know in the past we've had 
charts we can post in classrooms, mm -hmm. things like that. Just um, are we going to do anything like that? Just so that was one of the committee's charges is to provide us some feedback and some input on how best we can reach our community. So as you recall, when we looked at our stakeholder survey results, that was one of the areas that kind of came out right. is that our community doesn't necessarily know about our strategic plan and all of the work that we're doing. So um, Mr. Jinx was there and helped facilitate that portion of the, um, the session with the committee and got a lot of great ideas. So that's something that we're going to be looking into and, and can share with you as we move forward. Pike, yes. I, I want to echo what Mrs. Cox said. I enjoyed being there. It was a great opportunity to learn. And I think one of the uh, exercises that you led us through early on in terms of uh, seeing where everybody stood in terms of different things that you were trying to get accomplished, uh, that was a very helpful exercise in terms of uh, getting people's thoughts and perspectives. And uh, But I enjoyed it, and I thought it was, uh, like Mrs. Cox said too, uh, it was uh, really neat. Uh, uh, that students were a part of that, uh, and their perspective was uh, uh, really uh, special in terms of what they added to it, and, and, and the same from the parental perspective as well. So I, I agree that it was, uh, it was a very interesting day and a great opportunity to get the community involved, uh, not only for, for us to learn, but to learn from them as well. So thank you. Thank you. Very good. Well. I will thank Dr. Hinton and the staff as well for their work, but also uh, Mr. Pike and Mrs. Cock for uh, representing the board and doing, as you said, the kind of rolling up your sleeves and getting the work done. Uh, and one comment to piggyback on what uh, Reverend Cooper said on the on the key performance metrics for the for the I guess for the those are at the division level because then we have things at each where we have uh, measurements at each school and each in, in sub level, but. Um, it would be important for us to have an understanding of the baseline mm -hmm. because I think uh, while you may not have a particular target, you do the trend has got to be uh, in the right direction. And although we say we'll be reported at least every other year or every odd numbered year, um, without a baseline we won't know <clears throat> progressively if, if you know if we're getting where we need to do, if we need to make some mid-course adjustments or whatever. And some of these some are very straightforward, the accreditation, absenteeism, uh, teacher retention. I mean, those are uh, very uh, direct. But community partnership activities, I think you, that, that needs to be defined uh, so that you can measure it um, a little bit. Maybe you've already done that. But I, 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 um, I suggest that we go ahead and tag some, some numbers or some levels to that so that we don't get somewhere to say, now, where did we start? But we know where we started before we start taking future measurements so that's my only suggestion and probably one you've already thought of so but thank you anything else on this board members well thank you very much thank you yep all right thank you for the next item um, mr. Carroll will be coming forward to provide the board information on the accomplishments of our Henrico County Schools 2019 graduates specifically in relation to scholarships and recognition awards this, this, is, uh, this is subtitled, Show Me the Money. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, school board members, Dr. Cashwell, our high schools have prepared the scholarship and awards recognition report highlighting the accomplishments of the 2019 graduating classes. Our graduates continued the tradition of Henrico County students graduating with distinction and making wise decisions for life after high school. The 2019 graduates accepted 28 million $26,653 in scholarships. This past year, our 3,731 June and August graduates received 6,553 recognition awards. 80.8% .8 of our 2019 graduates have plans to continue their education in either four or two-year colleges, business schools, apprenticeships, or technical schools. 9.8% of graduates will be employed full-time and 3.5% have entered the military. 2,596 high school students completed 205,197 hours of community service. A copy of the reports from all the high schools will be filed with the clerk of the school board. Wonderful. Any comments, questions, school board members? Well, um, I know you're not here to take credit for it, but we really appreciate <laughs> Uh, those good numbers and the good uh, the good work that that represents not only by the students and their families but also by the staff 
and certainly not just at the high school level, but all along that got them to this point. So it's pretty remarkable stuff. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm, you don't have this, but would you know offhand what high, which high school got the most scholarship money? You know, I can get that for you. I don't want to, to state publicly because I, I'm not sure. We've had so many schools with, with such close numbers, it comes down to, you know, tens of dollars. So I can certainly get that for you. But I, I can't tell you, And you know, between the academic accomplishments and the athletic accomplishments, you know, it, it's I, very close. I, I thought it was in RICO last year, and if, I'm just trying to see if we maintain it again this year. I, I can get that for you, but I don't want to say that now. So. If it's not in RICO, just keep it. I don't want uh. to. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> that. I don't want it. I'm glad we're not here to take credit for anything <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Right. Thank no, that's, you. That's, that represents a tremendous amount of work. So, mm -hmm. And I will note that with all those volunteer hours, I can't get the high school students I know very well to help me cut my own grass. So somehow or another, i got to work on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The next item, um, Dr. Thomas Farrell, Director of High School Education, will be sharing information related to collaborative work that's taking place with both central office staff, our high schools, and our community partners to redesign and rethink the high school experience for Henrico students, not just where we'll have two new high school building facilities in place, um, but across the school division. So Dr. Farrell, Dr. Teigen, welcome. Thank you. Just his banner, <laughs> the clicker. Good afternoon, Chair Montgomery, Vice Chair Reverend Dr. Cooper, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. My name is Thomas Farrell, and I'm the Director of High School Education. This afternoon, I will provide the board with an overview of high school redesign for Henrico County Public Schools. To begin, let's examine the concept of high school redesign, which dates back to President Obama's 2013 State of the Union Address, where he called for a re-envisioning of the American high school experience. In his address, President Obama challenged high schools to better engage students by providing stronger connections to the educational needs and interests of individual students, ongoing new opportunities to personalize and tailor academic content and wrap around student supports, challenging students with rigorous courses, including new economy subjects such as computer science, and using innovative approaches and strategies to restructure the scope and time spent learning. Following Obama's call for action, school divisions across the nation began to closely examine possibilities for high school education. Simultaneously, research was being conducted on best practices for high school education. Numerous experts have argued that high schools are trapped in an antiquated system that does not attend to students' contemporary academic, social, and emotional needs. In 2016, Hanover Research examined how districts can redesign the high school experience. In their 44-page report, Hanover divided the research into two sections, which addressed high school redesign through academic success and social-emotional success. The outcome of the study served as yet another data point for school divisions to refine outdated high school practices to ensure both academic and social-emotional success for all students. The high school redesign philosophy aligns directly to the HCPS strategic plan in the Henrico Learner Profile, which outlines the skills, experiences, and attributes students need to acquire to be life ready. In addition, high school redesign is noted as an area of growth in Amy's passport, which is shown on the screen, which called for, which called for staff to develop a prototype for a high school of the future to guide the redesign of high schools across the division. As the board may recall, Highland Springs High School and J.R. Tucker High School will move into new facilities at the start of the 2021-2022 school year. With new construction comes the opportunity to rethink and redesign our approach to the learning experiences and opportunities we provide our high school students. Both schools are being rebuilt with a new facilities design that features flexible learning spaces, learning commons areas, as well as classroom configurations that will provide enhanced learning opportunities for students to communicate, collaborate, and interact with academic content. We are driven to begin our work in these new schools focused on best practices in instruction, content delivery, increased student engagement, and deeper learning experiences for all students. To prepare for the opening of the new schools in 21-22, changes were made to the master schedule this school year 
in order to support innovation, instruction, and to provide students with equitable access to division programs. The shift in schedules affords students who attend career and technical centers longer time periods for their CTE classes. The new Bell schedule also provides the opportunity to explore ways to increase field experiences and internship opportunities. As an extension of the architectural design, it is our desire to have the faculties of Highland Springs High School and J.R. Tucker High School serve as catalysts for the development of the innovative instructional practices and content delivery across the division. Tucker and Highland Springs view one another as partners in practice, and the two staffs will be able to lead other teachers in the district as they approach innovations at their schools. Through a connection with Dr. Karen Sanzo, professor at Old Dominion University, Highland Springs and Tucker became part of a network of Virginia high schools. Through the work with Dr. Sanzo, six high schools, including Bluestone, Charles City, Halifax, Highland Springs, Tucker, and Parkview, were awarded the Governor Northam High School Innovation Grant through the, through the Virginia Department of Education. The six high schools and four partner divisions are now collectively committed through a partnership to jointly reimagine high school through the development and implementation of innovative and non-traditional approaches to high school. By working in a collaborative structure, we will be able to share ideas, address common challenges to student success, develop knowledge around improvement practices, and cultivate and accelerate innovation. The High School Innovation Grant focuses on four goals. Goal one is the development of interdisciplinary courses. This approach to designing courses calls for high schools to integrate content from two areas in order to foster a deeper learning a deeper level of engagement and to create powerful learning experiences for students. Interdisciplinary courses support the six C's highlighted in our Henrico Learner Profile. The second goal addresses the need for students to gain real world experiences through internships and job shadowing opportunities. We believe it is critical for our students to learn from professionals the skills and knowledge necessary for success in the workplace and we believe it is equally as important for our students to connect their learning to real world experiences. The third goal calls for the development of a, of a student advisory model that includes a focus on social and emotional learning and career exploration. The fourth goal under the innovation grant, which is not listed on this slide, places an emphasis on the collaboration between the six schools. In addition to the four goals outlined in the grant, Henrico County Public Schools is 100% committed to use this redesign opportunity to create structures that support wraparound services in order to address the academic and physical well-being of the whole child. What does all of this mean for our other high schools? As Highland Springs and Tucker are engaging in this work, all high schools will be informed on the progress and the redesign journey through monthly principals meetings and will also have access to notes and other planning documents. Principals and their staffs will also have opportunities to participate in any of the redesign meetings and learning sessions that will take place at Highland Springs or Tucker. Some of our high schools already incorporate some form of a student advisory program where students are connected with a supportive adult in the building. Through our high school redesign efforts, we intend to formalize our structures and, and ensure a viable student advisory curriculum is developed for all high schools. Curriculum writing for interdisciplinary courses to be introduced in 2020-2021 school year at Highland Springs and Tucker will take place this school year. Teachers, specialists, and relevant community partners will work together to create innovative and relevant courses for students. Our other high schools will have access to these courses and will have opportunities to create additional interdisciplinary courses that meet the needs of their schools and communities. In addition, all high schools will be challenged to be creative about providing non-specialty center students with opportunities to have access to some of the specialty center coursework. This can be through individual courses or through the creation of additional pathways. As outlined in Amy's passport, the goal is for all students to graduate high school having had an internship or job shadowing experience. The opportunity exists through our high school redesign work 
to develop necessary partnerships and to also create a structure that supports this goal. All of our high schools incorporate some form of wraparound services into their high school program. Through this redesign process, we intend to create structures and more formal processes that support all students. The goal is for all high schools in Henrico County to be on the cutting edge of high school redesign as we start the 2021-2022 school year. Through our commitment to rethink and redesign our approach to instruction, we believe it is critical for the learning environment to match the learning experiences we intend to, pro to provide for our high school students. In addition to visiting schools during the 18-19 school year, where blended courses were taught and flexible furniture and learning spaces were present, Mr. Raymond, principal at Tucker, and Mr. White, principal at Highland Springs, toured Capital One along with school division and, and staff members, school, excuse me, school division uh, staff members to get an up close look at one example of what we are preparing our students for. As highlighted in our Henrico Learner Profile, learning should take place anytime, anywhere. And we plan to maximize every inch of the new Highland Springs and the new J.R. Tucker. As the board can well imagine, staff has been very busy and we are very excited about what the future holds for our high schools. To recap this series of events uh, for this work, a timeline for high school redesign is shown on the screen. Our work began during the 18-19 school year in a discussion phase by learning about high school redesign through research, uh, articles, studies, videos, and collaborative conversations. In addition, visits to other high schools and businesses help ground our design process. During this school year, during this school year which is considered a transformation phase, Highland Springs and Tucker will participate in a network of schools who also have the same goal of rethinking the high school experience. In addition, both schools will begin to create advisory programs and interdisciplinary courses, develop partnerships, leverage structures that provide students with access to internships, as well as serve as catalysts for change for our other high schools. During the 2020-2021 school year, the implementation phase will begin where we can expect full implementation of the goals outlined through the innovation grant by Highland Springs and Tucker. Partial implementation of the goals will be expected by our, by our other high schools. And finally, in 2021-2022, the execution phase will occur as all high schools will be completely redesigned in Highland Springs and Tucker in their brand new buildings and in year two of the redesign process will be the prototype high schools referenced in Amy's passport. As noted earlier in the presentation, the opportunity for growth in our high school program is woven into Amy's Passport. Through innovation, purposeful collaboration, idea sharing, and visits to one another's schools, all Henrico County High Schools will be seen as places where students have access to a world-class education which empowers them to be life ready. It is our desire that all of our high schools become prototypes for the rest of the state and we will truly demonstrate what it means to be one Henrico. The building of a new Highland Springs lends itself to many possibilities for the use of the existing facility. As a team, we discussed several ideas for the existing, for the existing space that would meet the needs of students and the community surrounding Highland Springs, as well as also creating additional opportunities for middle and high school students throughout the county. To provide additional support and wraparound services to the community, we are exploring ways for our students to access uh, medical professionals, dentists, and also mental health support. We will also explore options for workforce and career development by providing job and career training and counseling for adults in the community. For students, the additional space gives us the opportunity to increase capacity for the engineering program at Highland Springs and the potential to expand the ACE Center programs to provide exposure and access to students beginning in the seventh grade. Currently, students do not have access to our ACE Center programs until they reach the 11th grade. The additional space also lends itself to the creation of an incubation center similar to Startup Virginia. Through this structure, our students would have the opportunity to develop the entrepreneurial spirit by connecting with professionals in the Richmond area 
and learning about what it means to take an idea and turn it into a product. The possibilities are endless and are in alignment with our Henrico Learner Profile and the Deeper Learning Model. We have a tremendous opportunity to create a space that supports the needs of the Highland Springs community and the students of Henrico County. Before concluding this presentation, I would like to thank the principal of Highland Springs, uh, Ken White, and the principal of J.R. Tucker, Art Raymond, for their work and commitment to this endeavor. This concludes the presentation on high school redesign. At this time, I will be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for all that work. Are there any questions, board members? Anyone want to start? Did you have a, I saw Mrs. Cock taking I'll some start. notes. So I did yeah. take some notes. I've got one word and I think it's wow. I mean, this is exciting and innovative and what our, our parents and students have been asking for. And uh, so I'm excited to be heading down this path. Um, now, what I also was curious about is, you know, we're talking about the instructional piece of it. And then you mentioned that they, that um, the principals had gone uh, to take a look at the flexible seating and how the rooms are set up differently. Would these two new high schools in particular, um, you know, we've seen, we saw the plans and they looked like they're going to be classroom, 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 classroom with walls. Um, are we still in the mindset that there's going to be all these little classrooms or are we now looking that Yes, there'll be some classrooms, but we're going to have innovative, creative learning spaces as well. Right, a combination of both. So we'll have classrooms, but the, the furniture within the classrooms will lend itself to the flexible learning, mm -hmm. which will allow you know, teachers and students to you know, really move around the room and engage in um, you know, rigorous coursework and, and be creative, collaborative, and engage in critical thinking. But each high school will also have flexible learning spaces outside the classrooms, so students can you know, go in and learn in different areas of the building and also um, engage in sort of a shark tank type atmosphere where they can, you know, be creative and innovative with the different ideas. Um, they can um, be in what I would consider something like boardrooms or, or conference rooms um, to really, really take their learning to the next level and, and apply what they're learning um, with, with their peers. So. Yes, so there'll be, be a flexible mixture. space. Yes, a, a mixture. mixture of both. And yep. will we also have some outdoor learning places as well? That's in, that's in the conversation um, because we, we do want to take advantage of, um, you know, some of the outdoor learning. I know that both the principals are having conversations about uh, interdisciplinary courses where they're combining, you know, sciences with other courses. So we, we definitely like to take advantage of some outdoor learning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. And I think that it really is up to us to make sure that we do educate um, all of our stakeholders on this concept. Right. You know, I, I was talking about parents are, are wanting this, they get it. But um, some of our constituents who are not parents and they haven't stepped foot in a school for 30, 40 or more years are not gonna understand so much of what we're doing. And I think that we really are gonna have to market and educate all of our stakeholders on what learning looks like today and why it needs to look like this. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cox. Are there others? Yes. Roscoe, did you, we'll just move down the roster. Well, I just want to, um, I'm, the implementation piece, I know with the construction execution is 20, 21, 22. So after the execution is executed um, with those two facilities, w w what's the plan as far as the rollout for the rest of the schools? As far as, are we going to take the staff from these two schools and have them to become mentors in the other schools, or are we going to take the same the other schools through the same process that these two are going through now? Well, the expectation, although you know um, Tucker and Holland Springs are serving as kind of the prototypes, mm -hmm. the expectation is that we're we're collaborating with the other schools, um, not just in principal meetings, but um, we've sort of set up structures this year where. You know, we want teachers to get out to visit other schools and participate in learning in, in other environments. So while Highland Springs and Tucker are sort of the focal points, um, there will be opportunities for other schools to engage in the learning process. And while uh, Highland Springs and Tucker next year will be in somewhat of a full implementation mode, mm -hmm. the expectation is that we're also bringing the other high schools along, so they're in partial implementation. Um, one thing to note is that all of our high schools are already doing components of, of high school redesign in some way. Um, many of them have found ways to connect 
say through some sort of an advisory structure, and especially the new the, through the new bell schedule, has been very helpful to connect to connect students with a, a, an adult in the building. So we're really just just taking what our schools are already doing, and and sort of rolling that into the high school redesign process. So um, when Highland Springs and, and Tucker are going full force next year, our other high schools are partial. And then the following year, uh, we'll, we'll all be ready to go full force with the high school redesign process. So we will be bringing the other schools along um, over the course of the next few years. I was uh, in uh, Wilder Middle School yesterday, and I was looking, going, taking a tour. In one of the classrooms, they had desks, but they also had round tables. Right. And so some of the students were at the, the, the round tables with their laptops, collaborating with their peers, others were in their desks. I made the comment to the principal, I said, when I came up, all we had was desks. We all, you know, faced the front. I said it kind of tongue in cheek, but I also said it with a, a, a sense of relief because it was great to see the kids working in a collaborative environment, team building kind of environment, because that's what life is. It's not lived in, in isolation, but it's, it's lived in collaboration. And so that being said, furniture wise, classroom wise, with this redesign, are we also gonna look at changing some of the classroom structures in our existing buildings as well to kind of fit that mode where they have flexible spaces in their rooms? I know I know, it's probably cost prohibitive, right. but what can we do to, you know, because what happens when we build these new schools, the other ones feel like, wow, you know, it's the experience is so different, but how can we mimic some of it even within the parameters of what we have right now? That's the goal for all of our high schools to, to have the flexible seating, um, to allow for the type of experiences that we want to provide for students. And like you indicated, you know, we just have to put a plan together to make sure that we have the um, resources to support our other, other high schools. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Yes, Ms. My turn. Um, some of what you've described reminds me of some of the things that we see at Achievable Dream with the flexible space and working the, the collaborative effort. So I know we're doing this at the elementary level in one place. I'm hoping we can, you know, transition that up to the high schools. But you said we're going, the staff is going to visit other locations to get ideas. Um, if they haven't been to Cristo Ray yet, in uh, Cristo Ray, the new school mm -hmm. in Richmond, I met with them recently. And what they're doing with internships is sort of groundbreaking work. Um, their kids go to school four days a week and work one day a week in their internship. So just ideas uh, that comes to mind. But can you tell me where they are going and when do they have time to go to other places? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, with as busy as the teachers and the staff and the administrators are, when, when for example, when does Art Raymond go and do all of this um, visiting other places and, and seeing how other people are doing things? Great question. So they were able to get in uh, one visit last year, and we have uh, more planned this year. Mm -hmm. um, last year they visited um, uh, Kellum High School. Um, this year they plan to visit, um, I believe, Warhill and, and Williamsburg. And I think there's one or two more schools that I can't think of that they've identified that they'd like to take a look at. And this is really Art and Ken um, you know, doing their own research to determine where they would like to take some folks. and. We're working with them on taking, you know, a few teachers because we understand that, you know, teachers have to be in classes, but um, the teachers are excited and they enjoy visiting other places. So um, wherever they want to go, we'll, we'll send them. But I know they have at least two more schools that they'd like to, to visit this school year. Okay, that's great. No, I, I think it's, uh, I, I agree with Mrs. Scott when she said, wow, I, I think this is really exciting. I mean, because we, we updated our specialty centers a few years ago and that has gone so well, this is just the next step. I think it's great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mrs. Ogman. Mr. Pike, did you have, okay. Good, thank you. So um, some of the questions I haven't been asked, which is great. Uh, the, of, the, of the four uh, goals, if you go back to that slide, it's like uh, right, right there. The only one that, that the name kind of causes me, it doesn't match up really well with what you described as advisory. Um, and so, and could you explain again what that will involve and, and, uh, and maybe I'll understand how the name fits it better if you do that. Sure. So um, pretty much all of our comprehensive high schools uh, through the new schedule have gone to a structure where there's time built in during the day where, you know, students can visit with teachers to get additional support, uh, meet with clubs or meet with, you know, uh, sports or different sponsors. 
through the advisory process, um, students would be connected to one adult in a building. So let's say a, a teacher or staff member may have 20 students that they sort of see through high school. And the, the adult provides support around um, you know, academics, um, social emotional support. There are different lessons that they take the students through that, that are relevant to the different grade levels. So of course, you know, what the students would receive in ninth grade looks a lot different to what they would receive in, in the 12th grade. And it's really an opportunity for adults to help students, um, to, to guide students through the, through the high school experience um, from grade nine through two years beyond high school. Right, okay. And so we'll have a, a sort of a, of a formal curriculum, if you will, at ninth grade. These are, these are things that, you, that will need to be covered. And, um, all right. Very right. Good. I'm still st the name throws me a little bit, but that's okay. I understand what the what the purpose is, and um, I, I and think, I don't have a better name, so I'm not. Suggesting I was going to say, so. I think it's about adult advising right. kids through right. that process, Out, and so. And, and if I may, outside of the regular content, so you know, typically students would be assigned to correct. their course schedule, and then they're assigned to an advisor, if you will, outside of that, and that advisor has a block of students. Um, but in, rather than delivering traditional content, it would be uh, flexible for all the things mentioned, as well as taking kids through set lessons that deal with some of the things you can't squeeze into right. the regular content, like academic career planning, the social emotional pieces. Right. So I think that's where um, that term advisory blocks have come from. And, and I know uh, many of our high schools call them advisory blocks, as right. you will, but you're right, it's so much more than that. Right. It's more, much more than advising. So I think that's a yeah. great point. We can maybe innovate on the terminology some too. Right. Um, and then the other, let's see here, a couple more things. What happened? Oh, with the existing Highland Springs High School, and it, well, let's, let's, let me take my, my next question or consideration. So much of what you're describing occurs in some form or fashion at Code RVA. Uh, and one of the things that, that when I supported Code RVA was the idea that we would be able to have uh, a lab, if you will, to see things that worked and didn't work and, and uh, worked well and some that could translate. And there are things that are working especially well down there. There are things that they've had to adjust also. But the uh, flexible learning, of course, they have a, you know, they're on a year-round program. So much of their internships and some of the things in that fashion are not done where it's four days a week and one day with internships, but they have a block uh, in which those are designed and they're very uh, prescribed where there's, there's uh, the, the, the organization that is providing the internship understands what is expected of them as well so that the person's not there simply answering mail or sitting at a desk or, or, or going to lunch with somebody from time to time. Um, so I would, I would encourage us to speak uh, to Code RVA and find out uh, some more of what they're doing well and, and some ideas because, frankly, I don't know that much about the other schools that you described. Uh, but I know quite a bit about Code RVA, having sat on the board since its creation, and uh, I've been extraordinarily impressed. And they're doing, because and because of what you're describing that we want to accomplish, they're doing much of on a small scale, uh, I, I, and it's right here in our own backyard. I think we ought to take advantage of that. Uh, sure. And so I would strongly encourage you to learn more about that, or at least uh, inquire. And then the other. Um, Oh, the other point was with the existing Highland Springs High School facility, uh, since it will no longer be the Highland Sc Springs High School once we open the new facility, uh, that, that really provides an opportunity to do, I, I think we ought to start with the notion that that's going to be open year-round. I think we ought to just say that that's not going to be a, a, a nine-month facility. That's going to be a 12-month facility, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to do all of those things that we're talking about but it's going to find a way to do it year-round, and we're going to take advantage of that. And uh, I think if you go into it with that notion, if, and of course, that's a suggestion, but if you go into it with that notion, you automatically know it's going to be different. It's not just going to be another high school, or it's not going to be a, a, a satellite of Highland Springs High School, the new facility for overflow or ACE. It's going to be different. It is going to be a center for innovation. Because if nothing else, it's going to be the lights are going to be on <laughs> and the air conditioned humming <laughs> uh, all year round. So, um, and then if you then you, if you start to build to that, 
I, I think uh, you get yourself out of the mind frame of what are we, you know, what are we going to do in October, September, August when it opens? Oh, wait a minute. We're doing it all year round. And you can do some of those things that we're, that we're talking about there. And you can do them for the whole county uh, as, as a unique facility. So, yep. So anyway, those are, that's my couple of thoughts. And I, Reverend Cooper. A quick follow-up on the advisor piece. Will these advisors uh, be teachers who have additional responsibilities, or will these be outside the, the, the scope of, like, a counselor, um, like on a college level as far as academic advisors? Which, who are these people? Staff within a building. Okay. So we're, we're identifying specific staff. Right. Okay. Will they be compensated for additional roles or just in the purview of what their roles are now? Uh, just in the purview of what their roles are now. Um, it's, it's during the teaching day, so there's no additional compensation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, board members? Yes, Mr. Pike. I would echo just what you said about the, uh, the future for the current Highland Springs building. I think that's a really terrific idea to figure out how to make that a year-round concept. I think that gives a lot of opportunities for growth and innovation. And uh, I think the other thing that is exciting as this is, I hope that there's an opportunity to, uh, and the advisory sounds like a perfect way for that, is uh, for, for youngsters that we know that we talk about a lot that are overlooked, that uh, somehow, some way in these, in these two new facilities that uh, we don't forget that. Uh, every learner is different. Every youngster is different that comes to us. And so figuring out how to make sure that in these two new settings, these two new environments, that with all these new ideas that we don't forget about, you know, there's going to be some, some youngster that's just not going to quite fit. How do, we, how do we work and meet that youngster's needs? Um, and, and who knows? Uh, what Mr. Montgomery's suggesting um, it might, might be a perfect... Uh, another perfect opportunity to explore things like that as well. So I, I, I think this is really terrific. Uh, I think it's got a lot of potential and a lot of merit. Um, and I know this board talks a lot about equity and being overlooked. And I, and I hope that that's all part of the mix as well too. But thank you for all that you're Second. doing. Thank you. Mr. Montgomery? Y yes. Okay. Is I, I concur with my fellow colleagues who just all spoke here. It, and to, to wrap that, or actually just to bring it all together in the piece where we're talking about looking at, or as Mr. Montgomery suggested, looking at code RVA and the lottery system that they use uh, for applicants and for students that go to that school. And I think that that speaks to what Mr. Pike is getting to, too. That opens it up. It's not based on your grades. It's based on an interest. And then it's the lottery that picks up that piece to make sure that there's the equity that is also in there. Um, I'm very excited about the Innovation Center, and I do think that year-round would give us a lot of more opportunities, the ones that we can't even think of right now. Right. Because as we've said many times, we are preparing students for careers that have not been created yet. We don't know what those are going to be yet. And so I think this Innovation Center really will, will foster and breed our students so that they are ready for the next level uh, when they leave there. And I think they'll have a whole lot more ownership in the program, too. Very good. Thank you. I, yeah, I definitely think if you start talking about it, it's, if we start talking about it fall to summer, we're going to say what kind of school are we going to have there. If we start talking about it year-round, we're going to talk what kind of innovation, what kind of center are we going to have there, what are we going to build. And so I just to, if we can pull it off, it would make a lot of sense, I think. So, Anything else? Madam Superintendent, was that enough from us? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, first of all, for your support, but also for um, continuing to push us um, in innovative ways as we um, are really just um, at the beginning of what will be a long design process, but the outcomes are certainly going to be positive for our students when we think about what it means to be life ready. So um, we're excited about the work we've um, begun, but even more excited about where we're headed. So appreciate your support. All right, for the next item, we'll receive an update on Henrico County's Adult Education Center program offerings, and Greg Lawson and Mac Baton are going to come and provide that over, overview for you this evening. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell, colleagues and guests. We are excited to provide an overview of the adult education programs in Henrico County Schools. 
Greg Lawson is here with me, and he is the administrator for the adult ed programs. And he's going to tell you about the work that our talented 115 full and part-time employees do, not only for the citizens of Henrico, but for the citizens of the region. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the board. Today, I would like to share with the board an overview of the Adult Education Center um, and provide some highlights on the marvelous work taking place within our classrooms. At the Adult Education Center, we offer a variety of options for adults seeking to attain a high school equivalency certificate, or GED, improve their English literacy skills, or make themselves more marketable to employers. We also provide an option for adult, I'm sorry, we also provide an option for high school students who are at risk of dropping out. The Adult Education Center is comprised of 115 team members. We offer classes at six locations. Mount Vernon, which is our Western Henrico campus, our Eastern Henrico campus on Nine Mile Road, both Advanced Career Education Centers, Henrico Jail East, and Jail West. The Individual Student Alternative Education Plan, or ISAEP, is an educational option for high school students. It provides students who are at risk of dropping out with an opportunity to attain a GED certificate. During the 2018-2019 academic year, we enrolled 54 students, and of those 54 students, 34 attained their GED certificates, and eight of the students from the 2018-2019 year have returned and are continuing to work towards attaining that certificate. Adult basic and adult secondary education is our program that focuses on serving adults who express an interest in attaining a high school equivalency certificate. During the 2018-2019 academic year, we enrolled 408 students. Of the 408 students, 197 demonstrated a measurable skill gain in either reading or math. This was the highest reported skill gains percentage of all adult education programs within the capital region. 42 of those students attained a secondary school diploma or equivalent. We also participated in a pilot for the National External Diploma Program or NEDP program. The NEDP program provides adults with an opportunity to attain a high school diploma. Henrico was first in the capital region to produce an NEDP completer. As of today, we currently have two students who have been awarded their high school diploma through this program. And we remain the only adult education program in the region to have produced an NEDP, an NEDP graduate uh, during the pilot. We also have a presence in Henrico County Jails, where we are contracted by the Henrico Sheriff's Office to provide educational services to inmates at Henrico Jail East and Jail West. In addition to the programs listed, we also have a full-time ESL instructor who provides instruction at both facilities, and we also have a full-time special education teacher who provides services to both facilities as well. Much of the data for the corrections program is tabulated each year from January through December. So for 2018, uh, we enrolled 164 pre-GED students, 88 GED students, GED prep students, I'm sorry, 33 ESL students, 125 students were enrolled in automotive classes, 85 students were enrolled in workforce development classes, and 79 students were enrolled in cosmetology. For that same year of 2018, 17 students attained their GED certificate. 
Instructors also award progress certificates to recognize student achievement of a particular skill. 406 progress certificates were awarded in automotive classes. 86 progress certificates were awarded in cosmetology and 86 were also awarded in workforce development. There are still three months remaining in the 2019 calendar year. However, I have also included the 2019 data as of August 30th. As of August 30th, we have already surpassed the 2018 end of year enrollment for the automotive program. And we were three students away from meeting the 2018 end of year ESL enrollment. Regarding student achievement as of August 30th, we had already surpassed the number of GED certificates that were awarded for the entire year of 2018. So as of the 30th, right now we stand at 21 uh, GED certificates awarded. Uh, this slide right here is a side-by-side uh, -side representation of the 2018 end of year enrollment data and the 2019 year-to-date data. We also offer courses to Henrico residents with a focus on preparing adults for a variety of industry certifications, as well as personal enrichment. Each year we publish a fall and spring catalog that contain descriptions of those course offerings. Included on this slide is a small sample of the courses we offer. For 2019, our practical nursing program was ranked number four in Virginia by practicalnursing.org. This was an increase from the number 12 position we held in 2017. This year, we have also partnered with a local business by the name of Kitchen Time to offer Italian cooking sessions at their West Broad Street location. And uh, we also just recently were made aware of a company interested in tra training adults in residential maintenance. And our goal is to offer this opportunity to adults in the spring. Our most popular program is English Language Acquisition, or ESL. The focus of this program is to assist non-native English speakers with speaking, listening, reading, and writing in English. During the 2018-2019 school year, we enrolled 481 adults. We also offer a citizenship class to help our students prepare for the United States citizenship interview and test. Field trips are a very popular, popular activity within the program. Beginning in 2016, our team began the practice of offering at least one grant-funded field trip each year. Last school year, 72 students attended a trip to either George Washington's Mount Vernon or the Second Union Rosenwald School Museum. What I have shared today are just some of the outstanding achievements of our adult learners and teachers. On behalf of the entire adult education team, we appreciate the support provided by the school division and the opportunity to share this information with the board. Uh, this concludes the presentation on the Adult Education Center. Uh, at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. Members of the board, first of all, that was a heck of a lot of information and very impressive. Um, but who, I believe Mrs. Ogburn has a question um, or comment. I do. Could we go back? There's a slide that you showed that 1819 regional corrections, that one. I'm curious when I look at this, the first two lines of the GED program, why there is a reduction, why there is a, a drop of 164 to 116, 88 to 53. Um, the feedback that I have received from um, is that we're not meeting the needs of our regional corrections. Um, the people who are in the jail system that, you know, that's, this is one of the ways they can improve their lives and move on past and 
and what I'm hearing, and I would like to hear from you, is how many requests did we have for GED programs that we didn't meet, or how many um, people who are in the in the correction system who are not having um, their requests even heard, or they don't get into the program that they might be looking for. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, the chart on that slide. Um, the difference between the 2018 enrollment and the 2019 enrollment, uh, the first difference is, to answer the first part of your question, is um, for 2019, that number only represents nine months right. Out, right. Of, yeah. right, out, of, out of 12 months, where 18 is the entire 12 months right. of the year. Um, to answer the second part of your question, um, inmates within the jail do uh, submit or they can submit a request for services and uh, those requests um, have to be processed uh, by both jail and academic and Henrico County staff um, in order to get those students enrolled into programs. Uh, we did identify um, an opportunity to improve the, our ability to um, address uh, requests for services, and we have been actively um, implementing changes to ensure that uh, all of those requests are um, responded to in a timely manner. Um, I do not have the data with me now that would show an actual number of um, inmates who have requested services, though. If you could get that to us, I'd appreciate it. Um, the feedback I have is that we've had as much as 200 requests that were not processed and that we had requests for, you know, enrollment in the GED program that we, on our end, it's, you know, I, I, whether it's a staffing issue or I don't know what it is, I'd like to know the answer is if we have requests for inmates that are not being met and they're not enrolled in the GED program, because if you look at your, the number of, I think on another slide, you had 17 people get their GED. Seems rather low, but I don't know what the possibilities are. Um, so I would really like some more information on this part of it. Um, if we're not, if we have a system in place and we have staff that we're, you know, tasking with doing, uh, providing a service to inmates and we're not providing it like we should, I think we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, the, honestly, I, I have gotten feedback from uh, the sheriff's side of things that we're not meeting the needs of our inmates. And that's really concerning to me. Um, I, I think that we should be, obviously, because it's just their pathway to move forward. Yes. And if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, we need to know it. If I, if I could uh, comment, we have, uh, we have also been made aware of those concerns and have looked at a better process of tracking. They call it a blue note when a student's interested uh, in the programs. And we have made significant efforts to make sure that every blue note is addressed. There's multiple pieces of the puzzle that has to take place. When an inmate comes in, uh, there are several pieces that happen. Number one, first off, they fill out a, a form, and depending on the mindset of the inmate at that time, the information on that form might not be 100% accurate. Right. Uh, and so, you know, there's a process of going back and checking that um, information. But what we're really trying to do is come up with a better database so that when a when an inmate says, "I'm interested," we can. I could sit here and push a button and say we had 457 blue notes. We processed 457 of those 457, 325 were legit and the other right. 25 were, you know, we're looking at a better tracking system. Uh, unfortunately, in the past, we've, we're, we're using a paper system, a piece of paper that handed in. So we're trying to, you know, bring this to the 21st century mm -hmm. as well. And I've, a, Greg and uh, his team, along with myself, have been working very closely with the sheriff trying to figure out how we can do a better job of this. Uh, I can honestly say at this point in time, we have seen some improvements uh, and we're moving in that direction. Good. 
Well, and if you could update us as you find out more information and improvements are made, I think sure. that would be great. Um, it's, it's not information we get very often. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, maybe in a couple of months, we get more on mm -hmm. how things are changing and um, improvements that are being made. I think that would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. And then I, then I do have one other question, but um, the, the ESL numbers, you had uh, 481, I think it was, uh, Mr. Pike and I were talking. And I'm just knowing how large our um, ESL population is, um, in serving 481 adult learners seems like a small number to me, but I'm wondering how to, other than the, the booklet that we all see, because it comes, you know, mm -hmm. as the adult ed, you know, paper like thing. And how do we get the word out to our citizens that these services are available and that the classes, citizenship classes, I mean, 15 part participating in the class seems small, but I'm just curious, how do we, is it, is this available at our welcome center, for example, or how are we getting the word out? Sure. So, um, well, to answer your question about, or to address the 15 participating in citizenship class first, um, that in, in 2017, 2018, that was a new program that we started because we identified a need and some of our students were um, stating a need for that class. Um, so that's, we kind of started that from the ground up. Um, our first offering of that um, just had five students in 2017, 2018. And as we continue to try to push that, then it went from five to 15. Um, as far as promoting our program, uh, yes, we do have the, the catalog oh, yeah. uh, that comes out twice a year. Uh, we have also, um, engaged in outreach activities and promotion activities as far as um, television commercials. Um, we have been on Spanish speaking uh, radio stations. I can't think of the name of the station now, but Spanish speaking radio stations. And for our English language acquisition population, a lot of students come to us by word of mouth and by family members as well. Um, and in addition to that, um, I didn't mention it in this uh, presentation, but every year we um, work with Henrico Health Services and the Virginia Department of Health to offer a, a free flu vaccination opportunity to our community. And we've been doing that since I believe 2014. And each year we see a, a growing and growing number of um, participants or, or individuals coming to that program, coming to that opportunity from the English language acquisition community. So even something is, even that type of activity also brings individuals from the community into our building. They get to see uh, where classes are held and they get to learn more information about the program while they're there. So we do a variety of, of, of things that help to promote and help to bring awareness uh, to the opportunities that we have for our English language students. As for the number of students, I was actually there other night when they were enrolling and there, were, there was no place left in the parking lot. So I think really uh, one of the, the the pieces of this is the bandwidth that we have to serve these students and the student and the teachers that are qualified to deliver that instruction as well. Where do they hold classes like that? Is it centrally located? Do we do multiple sessions across the county? Um, so we're going to where people are as, a, as opposed to, because sometimes transportation issues, I'm just curious. Sure, um, for our English language acquisition classes, um, the, the majority of those classes are held at either our Mount Vernon campus mm -hmm. or our Nine Mile Road campus. Um, in the past, we have um, offered um, satellite classes for students, and we do the same thing for our GED students as well. Okay. Yes, Mr. Pike, please. Uh, Mr. Lawson, it's good to see you again. It's been a long time. Thank uh, you for the work that you do. Oh, thank you. Um, when you th look at that uh, slide related to English language, uh, do you know if transportation is a factor for individuals that are 
might have, would, would like to get to a place but can't because they don't have transportation? Do we know that? Um, transportation can be a, a factor. Um, that we've noticed um, that to be more of an issue with our GED students, okay. um, or at least our GED students have communicated that to us more than our English language acquisition uh, students. Okay. Um, yeah. in, in, in terms of staff uh, for the English language piece, um, if you had enough staff, could you possibly expand the satellite opportunities in the community? Uh, uh, you know, I. I, I well, I'm just thinking out loud. I'd ride by churches all the time, and I see mm -hmm. ESL banners mm -hmm. outside in front of them. So I've been attending a series of meetings at the Tucko YMCA called Meeting for Good. Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, they look at all kinds of things in the community, but one of the things they frequently come back to is transportation and, okay. and how that impacts people being able to get these wonderful services that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that, that's just something to maybe think about a little bit. And then um, related to the certificates that are awarded for automotive and cosmetology and workforce, do we have any idea whether or not those people, when the opportunity comes about for them, uh, are they able to get employed? Do we have any kind of follow-up that gives you that kind of indication if, if they're successful in, in that? Um, I do not have that data here with me, okay. um, but that is some information I can, okay. I, I, I can get for the board. I just would be curious to see, mm -hmm. once they get that certification, mm -hmm. whether or not they will are to become employed, okay? Thank you for Absolutely. all you're doing. I, it's, it's so important and having the opportunity to participate in the regional adult education graduation uh, last spring was, was really special and you, and you see the hard work and determination that people put forth to, to make some progress. So thank you for what you're doing, your staff's doing too. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Cooper. Um, thanks again, as uh, I echo what Mr. Pike said, all the hard work. Quick question, I've got a couple. First one is, um, the individual student alternative education plan, how are those students identified? Um, there's an application process uh, for um, students, uh, must be Henrico County, must be enrolled in a Henrico County public school, high school, um, and they can apply through their school counselor. Um, and we have um, admission periods every, about once a month. Mm -hmm. um, second question is, can you speak more on that national external diploma program? Can you just kind of give me an idea about that? Sure, the national external diploma program uh, is an opportunity for adults um, over the age of 18 um, to receive their high school diploma. Uh, we. As, the, as a region, we implemented or we rolled out a pilot program uh, that began uh, last school year where uh, participants could work towards receiving their high school diploma that is actually awarded through Charles City uh, Public Schools, which is a member of uh, the, re the Capital Region Adult Education Program. Um, so that process involves uh, those students completing projects um, and those projects being assessed and, uh, and graded um, in order, and those, uh, once the adults complete the required projects and they're evaluated and graded, uh, then they can receive their diploma. Last question quickly. Um, the, uh, for adult learners who are not necessarily seeking uh, a certificate or grade equivalence uh, degree, Diploma, is there an opportunity to provide tutoring or say refresher courses in critical subjects such as math? Um, example, when we had our Eastern and Rico um, forum, um, what happened was a, young, a grandmother got up and said that she's a caretaker and she has concerns about helping her child at home with their homework. So is there something we can do for refresher, for reinforcement of learning at school? Um, do, we ha do we offer that? Absolutely. Um, we have, um, we have an assessment process where adults come into one of our facilities and they take the test of adult basic education. Um, if they score below a 12.9 on the literacy level, then we can, prov we can use grant funding to provide services uh, to them and we can enroll them in class. Well, yes. I'm, I'm saying, say for instance, I've got, I've got a grandchild and mm -hmm. I need some refreshing on math. Oh. 
Can yes. I, is, do you have any kind of programs that allow um, persons who have, may have been out of school for a long time to get refreshers? Um, we, we don't have a program um, that is um, described exactly as you are, you know, you're talking about. Uh, however, we are responsive to the requests of our community. Uh, so if somebody does come into our building and speaks with the GED counselor and says, so, so may I Mr. Chairman, yes, may yes, I please. respond? Right. Um, I think um, the request or the question you're asking is related to um, grandparents or guardians raising children um, who may need assistance with helping their children with homework or accessing aspects of the school curriculum. And I think that um, while the adult education programs meet a number of needs, they may not be designed to meet that need as well. And so what we've um, endeavored to do is point those guardians or grandparents back to the home school, the school okay. where their child's enrolled. I know a number of our um, schools, particularly our elementary schools, will offer um, some workshops or things throughout the year on math or reading nights, that kind of thing to help guardians, parents, grandparents raising um, children to understand how to assist their students with those materials. But that's something that we're certainly um, um, looking to expand our efforts and our family outreach and, and thinking particularly of, particularly of the grandparents raising right. um, children. That, that came loud and clear at the community, but I think that's something, you know, we definitely want to point um, wherever possible um, families of students right back into their home school where their needs can be best served. I mean, I think that'd be great. You heard it you heard yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's, I did. It's, it's a growing population. I, I got a, a request today about a grandmother who's a custodial parent of a child. So the, the assumption that it's only parents raising children, you've got older generations who've been tasked with and taking care of those kids and we need to make sure that they get the reinforcement at home yes. to help their children. And there are some um, community organizations outside of this adult learning um, that are for grandparents raising children and that sort of thing. So I think the Department of Social Services and others have those, but certainly as far as making sure that each individual school has a plan for engaging their community of parents, guardians, grandparents as, as um, as guardians um, is something that our schools uh, work hard to do well, but we certainly can keep beefing up those efforts with that need in mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that point. Anyone else? If I could just briefly, I, I want to thank you again uh, and echo what Mr. Pike said, the, the completion and graduation ceremonies that you uh, host and the stories that are shared are uh, some of the most moving. Uh, and if a board member hadn't had a chance to participate in those, uh, I hope that they'll take that opportunity. It's just like Project Hope and some of the other uh, very moving and inspirational opportunities to see uh, people bettering themselves and their families. So appreciate all of that. Uh, as far as English language acquisition, yes. that, I believe Mr. Pike was pointing to this. This is not the only place where the folks who are needing to learn English are learning in our community. I mean, some of the churches offered, I know uh, uh, Catholic charities offer some courses and so forth. So we're meeting a part of that need. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously it's growing and greater, but there are others meeting it as well, I'm pretty certain. Um, let me ask you this real quick. On the practical nursing class, uh, is that is that a follow-on to what we're teaching at the, at the ACE program? Yes, sir. That's the second year of it. They okay. take the first nine months as a high school student, okay. second nine months as an adult. How, how are we doing? Because I know in the past that we've had some students who are, who are coming out of our 12th grade, having completed that program and moving into our adult, the, the second phase mm -hmm. of it, and are struggling. We are, I can honestly tell you, last year our, our, our number of completers increased. And I think the big help, one of the big helps there was the math teacher that was added. The math teacher spends a lot of time working with, because the T's test, which is a test that students have to take before they move into that second level, which is heavily math based. Right. They spend a lot of time remediating uh, on that math to get them ready for that. So the, the math teacher that we've added is in the high school? At, at the ACE centers. We have a the math ACE teacher. Center, that's right. And so, so because I know I remember, but we haven't had we hadn't added a, uh, a, a another person at the adult ed place. We're trying to fix it. We're trying to fix it before they get there. Good, very good. Yes. All right. And you see, you've seen some positive results. Absolutely, yes, sir. Last year was the first year doing it, and the num the 
the scores, and I do not have that number because I was following up on that. Right. Uh, a lot of it was the vocabulary. Right. Uh, just the way that we talk, a nurse talks about math is different from what we learn math in a high school classroom. Right. Uh, so that being able to translate that knowledge uh, was uh, powerful for the students. Yep. And that's, that's the bridge that needed to be built, from what I understand, from an anecdotal standpoint. And, and, and on that, I mean, that goes to show you, you know, folks say money can't fix all the problems, but that was a case where money could hire somebody who could begin to fix the problem there. So uh, it's certainly not a case of uh, so money and everything, but he, sometimes it takes the additional funding to hire the person to do the work to get it done. So I'm glad to know that it's working, not just because we found the money to do it, but because it's making a difference for people's lives. Yes, sir. And then the other uh, question I have for you is on the GED, the actual earners of the, of the diploma um, or the degree, what is the biggest choke point? Because we've got a lot of folks in the pre-program, and, and maybe you take it in two parts. Maybe you take it in correctional setting and then in a non-correctional setting. But what is the biggest choke point? We've got a lot of people in the pre-program, a lot of people in the program, and then the completers, the number's mighty small. Well, I would, I would venture to say that um, the, uh, what, helps, what helps to transition adult learners from a pre-GED or adult basic education setting to a GED prep setting to the point where they are actively taking the test while they're enrolled in class is that um, that that level that t if we're if we're trying to get them to a uh, tape score that is GED test ready uh, if, we, if we try to get them to a grade equivalence of about grade eight and also on a uh, on a GED practice test if they can um, demonstrate that they um, are test ready or close to test ready, um, that can help them um, transition to a, a G GED prep class. If, so, I could, if I could point out on also when the test changed, uh -huh. there was a major shift because the old test was a paper test. Correct. Uh, and now everything's computer based. And uh, I actually, you know, you're dealing with adults who have never, you know, they have to get over the computer fear of using a computer. They have to type an essay in a certain amount of time. And many of them are hunting and pecking. So, you know, a part of it is the backtracking of getting those computer skills up. It's not just the math, English, uh, history, and social studies. The computer skills also have to be in place. Uh, which I think has really caused a, a, a dip. And I think we're starting to see it come back up at any time a test change like that. Uh, also, you know, with the, the test, they have to go to a testing site. It, there, it's more involvement to becoming, G, to earning your GED than what it was when we could just have the paper test. I understand. And there was a period of time when it changed that we did, there was a concern about having access to computers right. and I believe that, that we've you, resolved that we've resolved that we've addressed yes, that again okay and so now it's it's uh, so they got the computer now it's getting folks up to speed not just with the core curriculum but with the actually being able to take the test okay yes sir. And, and I mean if you know if if there's a way that we have all these people going through the pipeline and they're getting choked at the point of taking the exam because of the computer, if there's something that we can do to help that, that's, in my mind, low-hanging fruit, if, it, if that's accurate. And so if there's a way that we can put a little lever on that, we might get, that may be a way to get. Well, we are, because of, you know, technology has helped us out with the, um, the computer issues in our classrooms, the students are learning more on the, on the, with the computer. It's, they actually take practice tests on the computer. The real issue gets into just the comfort of the computer. Okay. And I guess that comes with time, but maybe we, we have the ability to give more time. But so several years ago, they came to us and said, we got, we're changing the test. We need computers. We need labs. We need, I don't remember particularly, but the superintendent came and we were able to get that. And the board of supervisors supported it. We built it in the budget. So if there's something else, mm -hmm. I think the board, you know, let's don't be afraid to, if there's a choke point, if there's a place we can put a lever on it, let's put a lever on it and work smarter, not harder. So that's all I have. Anything else, anyone? Well, that's great work. You make us all proud. 
oh, you, make, you. A, you make our community a better place. So, uh, uh, because there's a lot of good people out there that really, y'all make a difference in their lives and that makes a difference in all of our lives. So keep doing, keep doing well while you do good. Right. Thank you. All right, thank you members of the board and also to our presenters, I'll just echo um, how pleased I am to see that um, despite what I know is a narrow bandwidth, when we think of all we do in K-12, that K-12 arena, and then um, open up the windows into what we do for our adult learners, whether it be in correctional facilities or um, just our adults in the community who want enrichment or those in, in other arenas, um, we're certainly making an impact. And so we appreciate all that's being done. And we'll keep looking to see what we can do to refine that and if there are any um, pain points that can be addressed with the budget or beyond. And, and keep that in mind and report back to the board. Yeah. And one other thing, uh, Madam Superintendent, and, you know, we have to keep in mind with the uh, correctional folks that you, we have a start day of school and we have students come in. They may trickle in over a week or so, but this is a place where you're constantly having new students show up mm -hmm. and they are expressing an interest in the class. We have teachers that are teaching students all along. You have teach then, then suddenly a, a student who may be making great progress or not great progress or about, and suddenly they're no longer in, uh, you know, available in that classroom for whatever reason. So okay. it's not, uh, it is a, it is a uh, tremendous workload and a tremendous task that we're asking people to do. And so uh, if, if we need to do more to help, but also it's just, we can't lose sight of the fact that it's not, it's beyond, it's, it's unique. Uh, and beyond extraordinary. It's absolutely unique and challenging work. And, and Mrs. Ogborn, I appreciate you bringing forth that concern that you'd heard related to the jail's education. It matches the same feedback um, we'd already received and begun to um, work on a way forward to enhance our processes there. But we'll absolutely report back and hopefully we'll see a difference and be able to um, share some numbers with you in the future. All right, for the next item, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, um, Dr. Teigen will be coming forward to both share information and then subsequently ask for your approval of a revised 2019-2020 calendar. And this deals specifically with um, three adjusted dismissal days that had been only for high schoolers um, related to um, exams. Dr. Teigen. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. The current approved 2019-2020 school calendar was approved back in December of 2018 and was revised um, by the school board at the work session in August. And on August 8th, I recommended that the board approve making Tuesday, March 3rd, a student holiday and staff clerical day due to the presidential primaries. But since that time, the Division Assessment Committee called for in Amy's passports with next steps, recommended changes to the division's balanced assessment program. The assessment committee is comprised of teachers, school administrators, and central office instructional staff. And based on the review of teacher and administrator feedback, the committee made recommendations related to three assessments, one of which was the midterm exams. The committee noted that five of the last six years high school course midterm exams had been canceled due to inclement weather and staff feedback reported that little formative use of the data was made as well as they noted a lost instructional time even when midterms had been administered. In addition, the central office staff received a tremendous amount of feedback from both parents and students regarding current midterm practices within the division. So the committee considered all angles and points of view and their recommendation was to discontinue the division's current midterm exam practices in order to provide additional time for instruction. Teachers may still choose to administer cumulative summative assessments at various points in the year, though not in a traditional midterm format. Thinking of the Henrico learner profile and looking towards more performance-based assessments, there's, there, it opens the opportunity. And the division leadership team considered the committee's recommendation and approved changes to the midterm exam for the 2019-2020 school year. And thus, I would recommend eliminating the early release days in December that were set aside for exam, midterm exam days um, and make those full school days. It's important to note that these were already, they were already fully 
full instructional days for all of our other students, including middle school students who were taking midterms as part of their high school credit courses. Okay. Members of the board, uh, this is actually an action item uh, yes, sir. for this evening. So are there any questions regarding the calendar and the, the changes that have been brought forward? Okay. Uh, yes, just yes, real Mr. quick. Pike. Um, in June, uh, isn't there a primary that takes place? There could be. Okay. Yes. And that, if my memory is right, takes place during that uh, second, second week of week. school during exams? Yes. Okay. So we'll revisit that. We, we will be monitoring and watching, and if we need to um, make sure that our schools are safe, our students um, right. are not in school, we'll come back to you with a request. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pike. Anyone else? Is there a recommendation? All right. Well, I am asking that the school board approve these revisions to the calendar. I apologize. I turned that off a second ago. <laughs> I'm asking for the board's approval to the revision to the school calendar for 1920 school year as shared by Dr. Tigan, making those three adjusted dismissal days for high school students only full instructional days for high school students. Thank you. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding revision to the 2019-2020 school calendar as outlined by Dr. Tigan. Is there a motion to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Cock. Is there a second? Second. Second by Reverend Cooper. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. The calendar is adjusted. Thank you. It's interesting we can adjust All the calendar. Right. Thank you. Next is the recommendation that the school board accept the $723,332 in funding from the VDOE to provide the funding of the Virginia Career Technical Student Organization, or CTSO, for the fiscal year 2019-2020. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding acceptance of the grant from VDOE to support the Virginia Career Technical Student Organization. Is there a motion to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Moved by Mr. Pike. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Ogburn. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The grant is accepted. Thank you. Next is a recommendation that the school board accept the $1,018,006 in funding from the VDOE to provide the funding of the Career and Technical Education Resource Center for the fiscal year 1920. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding acceptance of the 2019-20 grant funding from VDOE to support the Career and Technical Education Resource Center. Is there a motion uh, to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So we'll move by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The grant is accepted. Thank you. Next is the recommendation that the school board accept the STEM Early Learning Through the Arts Grant Award of $70,000 from the Virginia Department of Education. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding acceptance of the STEM Early Learning Through the Arts Grant. Is there a motion uh, to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Pike. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. The grant is accepted. Thank you. And my final recommendation related to grant funding is that the school board accept approximately $42,200 in funding from the Maymont Foundation via the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for the Be Wet grant. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding acceptance from the Maymont Foundation via the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration BWET grant. Is there a motion uh, to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Next, um, Justin Briggs will be coming forward to provide an update on the redistricting process and also, of course, will be um, asking for your approval related to an alternate um, committee member who's coming forward. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. I just wanted to provide a brief update of the redistricting process this afternoon. 
We had our first two meetings on Monday and Wednesday night. Um, both were very informative and we got lots of great questions from the committee. Um, the webcasts and all materials are now on the website as well as a brief interview with Matthew Cropper explaining some of the um, ins and outs of the process. Um, our next two meetings will be on September 23rd and 25th and we did have one committee member uh, from the Fairfield District resign on Monday and we request that you approve their replacement. Do you have any questions? Members of the board, are there any questions or comments? I know uh, several of you attended one or more of those sessions and we appreciate that uh, representing the board there. Are there any questions about the process? If not, then is there a motion um, so moved. regarding the <laughs> appointment? of the replacement. So the, move. It, so I'm move. sorry, just a moment. In the Fairfield District, is there a motion? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, so moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper, is there a second? Second. Oh, it's, it's been approved already then. Uh, seconded by <laughs> Mrs. Cock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the report and all the hard work. Thank you, Mr. Briggs. And I would um, point out, members of the board, that you've also received a, a second binder along with the strategic plan updates that is, um, com has the complete materials that were shared with committee members. And of course, these are also available on the online site. But I just wanted to make, your, make you aware that you have those in front of you. And that concludes items from the superintendent. Thank you so much. Members of the board, is there any unfinished business that uh, you would like to share with us? Yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman. There is. Uh, hold on. Is there any unfinished business? I've got some get, finished, finished. Go ahead, Reverend Cooper. <laughs> so I want to, I want to thank um, the superintendent and her capable and competent staff, because while we were in our meeting, Mr. John Carroll did email me, and he says, Roscoe. That'd be you. And Rico High School accepted $5,123,535 in total scholarship, which was the highest in the county. So I would like to congratulate Enrico High School. <laughs> Anything else, Reverend Cooper? <laughs> no. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, that's very, that's, uh, that's always good news. So thank you. Yes, sir. Is there uh, anyone else have any old business? Anyone else have any new business? You sure you don't have any new business, Reverend Cooper? <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, thank you, Ms. Um, Ms. Ms. Ogburn. So we want to thank the superintendent and staff um, for coming out and participating, as well as our county manager um, and others for our Eastern Henrico um, Forum. I want to thank my peers, um, Mr. Pike and Ms. Ogborn, for being present. Um, it was very informative. We got some great questions. I mean, we will be... Uh, addressing those at a later date as far as what we're going to do in regards to um, persons' concerns and also their suggestions. Um, just as we stated earlier, a grandmother came and, and spoke um, passionately about her raising her grandchild but not feeling comfortable assisting with the homework. So I think it's always good when our uh, parents and community members and leaders have an opportunity to engage us and to talk to us. And I want to commend our superintendent for standing flat-footed and, and asking and offering herself up for any questions, and so hopefully we can um, we can uh, the word we can um, do that again. We can replicate it um, across the county because I do think it was worthwhile. So thank you again, Madam Superintendent, and to the staff and to our division leaders. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Then I will only add that uh, just about one month from today, on October the tenth. At, uh, in the evening, there will be the 25th anniversary gala for the uh, Henrico Education Foundation. Uh, that group set out to raise uh, $200,000 as an infusion into the, um, into the uh, uh -uh. program. And, uh, and so they have met that. As a matter of fact, they've exceeded, and I believe they're around two hundred. dollars $25,000 now. And I have tickets for anyone who has not received their ticket yet or would like to purchase those. Individual tickets are now on sale. So with that being said, our upcoming board meetings are, uh, the next board meeting will be the 26th. We will begin with a work session at 2 p.m., which of course is subject to revision. Uh, that will be followed by a public hearing, which is scheduled for 530 
uh, which we will be seeking input on the proposed revision to the strategic plan, which was shared with us and is available on the website. And then, of course, our monthly meeting will begin promptly at 6.30 p.m., all of which will occur here in the New Bridge Learning Center Auditorium. There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned.